Hello friends, I'm John Merrill and welcome back to Brainstorming America. We've got another exciting episode for you this week and I'm delighted to be back with my friend Ken Rollins. Ken, tell us what's on score this week, my friend. Well, it's good to see you, good man. Good to see you, you brother. You've been traveling today, I can tell. No doubt. <laughs> I, I don't see how you do all that. I get from one place to another. You go to all 67 counties and every time I turn on Facebook, there you are somewhere else and I say, what's that old saying? If where you, wherever you are, there, there you are, or something like that. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, I would like to, with your permission, yes, sir, uh, a subject I'd like to talk about is just blowing up the TV. As I was leaving today uh, to come out here, even uh, is the the Donald Trump saga, uh, of the legal and the political issue regarding. Uh, the not just the legal part, but the, the political part, what's going on with him, because I got a feeling there's a lot of people out here, Ms. Jones and people around America, that do not really know, and I'd just like to say that from my perspective, if you'll just notice that the issue with the, that they had on for seven years with the lady uh, lay for all those years, but just as soon uh, he'd been in office all the time, nothing happened. Two years after he's out, and he notified he was running for re-election, all of a sudden that sprang back out. Yes, sir. So that's a legal issue brought in politics. Obviously. That's, that's what I want you to address because you from that world. Yeah, and politics. it's very clear that if there was any intent by the prosecutor to ensure that justice was served, that they would have filed the charges much earlier. And of course, if you've read the indictment, then you know that what actually is being presented, uh, none of those crimes are disqualifying felonies. None of them are felonies, and none of them would result in him being ineligible to be a candidate for the highest office in the land or any other office. So at that point, uh, it's strictly political theater, and that's what it's being presented as, but what they want you to believe from the prosecutor's office there in New York is that they're trying to take this criminal off the street and to make sure that he's not able to harm anyone else. Uh, President Trump may be a lot of things, but a criminal who has the potential to harm someone else is not one of those things. Being from New York, having and you can't see anything without looking at Trump Towers. And the, there's a little bit of jealousy involved in that, probably a whole lot. But over the years, I've, I heard this Bragg guy talk about, I've uh, I, I seen one place where he said, I've taken on the Trump family over 100 times. This prior to this, this is, this is a man that run for office based on I'm going to get, you know, it's like I'm going to get John Merrill. That's right. my thing. I'm not going to build streets or right. put, up our, put out a good uh, uh, protection system for the citizens and uh, the law enforcement thing. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go get John Merrill. All right, in this case, I'm going to get Donald Trump. They said that. Yes, sir. The, the woman that did the one for the state of, uh, of uh, New York. So they, it's, all of them have come out. Vance, who was the attorney general before, he threw it out. Right. F the, uh, what's the FEC or the Federal Election Commission, they passed over. Yes, sir. So it's already, uh, all the big boys passed over, and he's getting in there bringing back up some stuff right. he found laying on the ground. It's very disappointing, but it's where we are today, and that's something that the American people will have to take into account when they're determining who they want to support in the 2024 Republican nomination race. I think it's very clear that there's going to be a number of candidates. There's going to be a number of different people who have varying philosophies of conservatism, who have different backgrounds as far as public services concerned. But I think that if there's one thing that we all know is that everyone knows and understands the record that President Trump has. And so if they are wanting to have somebody other than him, then they'll have an opportunity to vote for someone else. But I think one of the things that's very clear is that there are a number of people in all 50 states throughout the union who feel like President Trump's work was undone when he left office January the 20th, 2021. And many of those people want to see him have an opportunity to serve again 
in the highest office in the land. So we'll see what the people say and we'll see where this goes as the primary season comes into play in January. You did such a segue to bring me into what I want to say. You go down and they, every once in a while they mess up with the cameras and they show that stacks of steel, stacks and stacks and stacks of steel to build a wall. Yes, sir. That has already been paid for by mine and your money. Right. The people that have been, to put it in the ground have already been paid to do that. But it's laying there, and all it's got to do is the people that was paid to put it in the ground need to put it in the ground. That's right. Just think about that. That that was what Donald Trump would have done. Now look what we're doing. Millions and millions and millions, and we've got to 7 million kids. They don't know where they're located. Yesterday, testimony from Mario Ocas or whatever his name is, saying, no, we don't have a problem at the border. This is the Biden administration saying, look what's happened to all the millions of people that we got here. And I watched the mayor of, um, of New York yesterday pleading for federal help to take care of the illegals that he invited in there with the open, you know, what they call it? Uh, the sanctuary, sanctuary cities. cities. Yes, sir. All of a sudden, there was no sanctuary. And, and just about no city left up there. there was. That's right. You see the, the young police officers just standing there? And a guy walks out, hits her in the back of the head. With yes, sir. Her. And I see some of our friends locally here going up there to visit New York City. Yes, sir. But they talk about the smell of the, the urine and everything on the streets. And then you got the marijuana now open. And uh, it, it's, it's a mess. But Trump did all that. But I want to throw something else. And let's talk about that when we come back from the break. We're excited to be with you today. Thanks again for joining us. We'll look forward to our next segment. And welcome back in to Brainstorming America. I'm here with John Merrill. And, John, we were talking as we went to a break um, about some of the things that uh, Donald Trump's uh, accomplishments, if you will, and uh, why I think it's a, it's a shame as to what's being done to him politically and calling it just uh, justice, but it's not. It's political. But I, I want to just remind the people of some of the things that I would like to people to keep in their mind. For years and years, nobody, no leader, had ever talked to the head, the daddy or the son of North Korea. Yes, sir. And there was a conversation. Had anybody ever talked to him? Of course, Trump, being a businessman and not a politician, said, well, why ain't nobody talked to him? Right. And you remember that? And then, oh, he, went, then he went over to visit him to some yes, island sir. of it. And then the next thing you know, Trump is standing in North Korea that nobody had ever been. Right. And all I remember the people in Hawaii, Japan, digging those tunnels because little Rocket Man was going to blow everybody away. Right. And Trump said, let's talk to little Rocket Man. Right. And look what happened. That's right. And, and you know, look, Ken, this is the thing about working with the president and knowing President Trump. President Trump is one of those people. He's a rare individual in a lot of different ways. But one of the things that he believes is that given enough time, uh, given enough resources, given enough opportunity, he can convince anybody to do anything. And he believes that he could convince um, the Korean leader in the same way that he could you or I in a business deal. And sometimes that leads to some concerns. But one of the things that he has proven is that when he's given the opportunity to sit down and to talk about how they can resolve an issue or how they can approach a particular issue to make sure that a, a resolution that's mutually beneficial for everybody can be achieved, he's been able to do that more times than not. It doesn't take an opportunity to read uh, many of the books that he's penned or the books that have been written about him to know that he is a successful negotiator and that's one of the reasons why he's been able to make as much money as he's been able to make. But we need and have needed more of that in the Oval Office because too many times, too many of our leaders have been too reluctant to step out and try to make that connection that you were talking about. And you never know what can be resolved whenever you have the initiative to reach out and to try to make a difference. I wish people would just think about the biggest scare we have now is China, and rightfully so. But when Trump was in there, let's go back now and remember that, that in Mar-a-Lago, and they just had the main meal, 
main course, and they got dessert. Uh, in between the main meal and the dessert, uh, Trump got a phone call. Stepped away from the table, went over here and ordered uh, the missiles into uh, Syria. Right. Took out ISIS. Right. Goes back to the table with G, G or whatever his name is, head of China. Right. Excuse me, I had to step away and order a bombing on Syria. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so you're dealing with that kind of man versus somebody that goes to sleep, can't remember his name, don't know where to turn. In the middle of a speech. And, uh, absolutely, and can't remember who he's giving the speech to. That's right. You can't put that there beside somebody like what I was getting at as a businessman, whether it's building golf courses, you say they ain't no way a golf course works. He spent years and years saying, yeah, this will work. Yeah, putting a building over there. Remember the thing about the skating center downtown? That's right. He finally got the city of New York to say, give me the I'll fix it. He didn't just run over budget. He just went in there and, and took Did it under budget and before they were expected it to be finished. Absolutely. And and so his his ability to do that, he put, applied it to his leadership as a leader of this country. And and we were he made China for the first time in my life, I started paying tariffs on them. <laughs> we were getting money from China rather than paying. And so they were not any fear. He put more tariffs on uh, Russia than anybody had done in the past. So, well, Ken, uh, it's just like when you think about China and you think about the breakthrough that happened in 1972 with President Nixon, people often said at that time President Nixon was the only person that could have gone to China because he had been such a... Uh, a red baiter, uh, a red hater, somebody that had initiated conversations mm -hmm. about communism and how um, hurtful it was to society as a whole. And yet he was the one that reached out to make sure that the doors were open to initiate trade in China. And at the time, President Nixon was the only person that could do that. And it's my belief that since his presidency, President Trump is the only person that could have really had the results that have been produced from a relationship with China to benefit all Americans, and I think that's very, very important. What do you think Trump would have done if they'd have been sending a balloon over his America if he was president? Uh, Coach, I don't think it would have made it very far. <laughs> well, for another thing, I don't think China would have tested him because when you got somebody that is so predictive, like Biden, you can do anything. Don't worry about it. Just point him that way. If you want to do something over here, just point him over that way. But Trump, you, if you're in business or if you were in a leadership of a country, you're not going to test him because you just you got to say, he just might do something. You know, I'm sitting here listening as a leader of the biggest country uh, power called China, and I'm just getting ready to eat my dessert and hear this my my host. Is telling me he just ordered a country to be blown up, and the, one of their biggest enemies, ISIS, wants them taken out. And while we were having, I was getting ready my dessert, he took them out. My God, I, what I ain't gonna do? I ain't gonna mess with him. I ain't Absolutely. gonna mess with Taiwan either. Absolutely. So that's that's what it is. You know, it's like Ronald Reagan was <laughs> was like uh, work from from strength. You know, he 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 had people believing we had. During the Star Wars thing, yes, sir. we didn't have all that stuff, but it looked good. It looked good for the presentation. Well, and that's why, Ken, it's so important to realize sometimes it's more important to have the threat of the power than the exercise Absolutely. of the power. We'll talk more about that when we return for our final segment. And welcome back to Brainstorm America. I'm here with John Merrill, and we, John, we were talking about uh, the president, and some of the accomplishments and things that, that affects our lives. But it, when he went in, I want people to remember what we had and what we got. It, one of the other things that s sticks in my mind is when he went in there and he met with NATO and there's all these different countries getting things from us, but they weren't paying their fair share. And he went in and started saying, you're going to pay and you're going to pay and you're going to pay. And everybody back on, oh, my God, oh, my God, he's going to blow up. <laughs> he's gonna, you know, it's going to tear them off. Oh, they paid up. They're Absolutely. Pay, they're still paying today more than they ever was before he went in there. Well, it's not unlike what he did with the wall when he told the 
Mexicans that they were going to have to pay for the wall. And they're like, how are we going to pay for the wall? And it's because of the tariffs that were imposed and things that were necessary to show them that we were serious about the negotiation. And that's the thing about him being such a strong and effective negotiator. That's why if you choose to read The Art of the Deal, which was his first book that came back uh, it came out in 1987, it's been reprinted several times since 1987, that you can learn a lot about his negotiation style and why it's so important to have someone like that as an effective leader in our Oval Office in Washington, D.C. One, one of the worst things that we ever had, in my opinion, was the NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, that took if you remember Avondale Mills, all the cotton mills that were around Cleveland County, Calhoun County, I worked at Avondale Mills out of Birmingham when I got out of the service. It was a place where people could work, men and women, could make a good living. You know, and when I got out of the service, not many good jobs out there for that was available, but I had to drive all the way to Birmingham. But it was a good work. And after coming up, we, got, get, we started sending everything to uh, Guatemala, all these different places. All of our cotton mills moved south. Everything moved out, and there's no other place. that Piedmont, I, had, I think, had two or three springs. Well, industries look, Sewell's Manufacturing yeah. in Cleveland County, Russell Mills down in Alexander City, all the sock factories that we had in DeKalb County up near Fort Payne that put thousands of people out of work. Mm -hmm. uh, all of those things happened because of the North America Free Trade Agreement and how it negatively impacted our people. And, certain parts of the nation and predominantly in the southeastern United States that was a major blow for our people because those jobs had moved here because of some of the um, concerns related to labor agreements that had taken place in the Midwest and in the Northeast yeah. and those jobs came here but then when those jobs were eliminated because of NAFTA it, it put a number of our people in a very difficult spot. It ended up Trump establishing the Canadian uh, Mexico and American agreement. Uh, well, and I know, Ken, you remember I was at the signing of that agreement in Washington when it actually occurred, that. yes, sir, back in January, February of 2020. Uh, it was the first time I'd ever in, been invited to a uh, packed signing agreement there at the White House, and it was out on the South Lawn. It was a, an unbelievable experience, but wow. I, I really feel like having that leadership to show how we're going to use North America to bring back those jobs and to bring back that relationship that we had to have in order for the American people to be able to flourish. Well, right now, you know, the the labor in uh, Guatemala at about $3 an hour versus 15 to $18 here, that's the lure. That's, that's the lure that pulled it in pulled everything out of America. Our leadership fell for it. Our Democratic uh, Bill Clinton people sent it south. Then we have, uh, then Trump comes along, he tries to put it back together to where we can get. But you know, right now, the Biden administration has children. They, they showed a thing the day before yesterday. Children from across the border are being put out like slaves. To work for different people, and they're, they're sex slaves too. These, they're, they've got 99 million of it they can't account for, and these kids, whether they're teenagers or younger, they're still making making work in these plants. They said some is nine years old were running, uh, in fact, working in factories. We we're, we're going to do that. We're making using these people for slaves that are coming across that that border. You got to think about. Well, there's nine million already crossed over here. Where are they? Where, where are they? What are they doing? You don't see them at Walmart and say, well, what are these people doing? They're, they're being used as slaves by these corporations out here. They say, go down and find me 20 or 25 uh, Latinos that's just crossed over. But Ken, I think it's important for us to introduce one more time about immigration. Neither one of us are opposed to immigration as long as it's done legally. We encourage immigration. We want anyone that wants to come to the United States to come, but we want them to come 
the right and the appropriate way. And there are laws that govern immigration in the United States. If you don't like the law, you don't break the law, you need to change the law. You do that through the legislative process, not through executive order. And I think it's very important that we do what we can to continue to educate our members of Congress, our United States Senators, so that they understand how important this issue is to us. It is to you. It is to all Alabamians because we want to make sure that we're protecting our people. We want to make sure we're protecting them from criminal activity and criminal minds. We want to make sure that we're protecting them from nefarious activities and nefarious intent that is introduced by some of the people that you're referring to. And Ken, we want to make sure that anyone that wants to come to the United States has an opportunity to do that in a legal manner. I'm, yeah, I want to make sure if we don't get anything out of this to accept I want to make sure that the people that's out there watching, they use their their brain and just think, why is it so important that we bring down this man that done so much? Why is it so important to this administration, this new one, to bring him down? And the reason is because of what we've talked about. He has done all the things that they're not doing. and it's made us a, a better country, and they know if he, as soon as they, he announced he's coming back and run again, that's when they come after him. And uh, I, I, for one, I, it's not that I'm uh, a Trump supporter as much as I am an American. I love this country, and I hate to see people doing to it what they're doing. Well, Ken, I don't think there's any doubt that President Trump helped to save our country by appointing Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett to the mm -hmm. United States Supreme Court. The decisions that have been made since they've been justices of the Supreme Court and the direction that our country has moved back into a more conservative thought process, a more conservative philosophy, is a benefit to all of us. We've been excited to be able to share with you again this week another outstanding episode of Brainstorm in America. We will be with you again next week. Ken, thank you. It's always good to be with you, my friend. Good to be with you, sir.